everybody. Uh, my name is Trish Cotter. I am a, uh, the executive director of the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship. I'm delighted that uh, these panelists are here to join me. But I just wanted to start off with just to a baseline that MIT's legacy right now, 30,000, my, I teach with Ed Roberts, and Ed did quite a bit of research, 30,000 companies they've created, 4.6 million jobs, 2 trillion plus revenue every single year they're generating. If you collectively did that, it would be approximately the 10th largest economy in the world. Okay, take a look at the size of the school. So I think that the legacy is there, and we have some people who are have part of that legacy, and I'm sure we have some future entrepreneurs here as well. <laughs> so uh, without ado, I will, they, there is a biography in there, but these, um, the accomplishments that uh, these women have, I really think some of them are uh, amazing, so I want to go through them. Gabby. You. So Gabby Haddad started her career as an M&A lawyer at a large firm in New York. She left the corporate law to join a finance corpor uh, institution in Switzerland that finances health projects in emerging markets. And she found that traditional approaches to solving problems uh, were not enough, so she came to MIT and immersed herself into technology and founded a terrific company called Sigma, Sigma Ratings with a fellow student. Jean Hammond. Jean is an active angel investor and the founder of Learn Launch as well as Boston Branch of Golden Seeds, as well as a member of Launchpads and Hub Angels. Jean serves on the boards of the Technology Capital Network, Thompson Island Out Out Outward Bound, and Boston Rising. She plays or has played an active role with a number of her Boston area investments, including Crimson Hexagon, Higher Reach, Home Portfolio, iTeam, and Zipcar. And there's a nice write-up in the book about a list of accomplishments. She is a frequent speaker at MIT on entrepreneurship topics. I find her quite helpful for uh, the students, and a, uh, she is a very sought-out uh, mentor. Iskara Menez is a serial entrepreneur, and she's building Labor X. Labor X is a talent marketplace that connects hiring managers to vocational, boot camp, apprenticeship, and community college graduates, connects them, using predictive skill analytics and 3D resumes. Iskara has worked for three educational startups, bringing tutoring to 10,000 low opportunity students. She started a tutoring business in high school, helping uh, kids in her neighborhood who were struggling in school. Um, that is true for a lot of incoming MIT students. They do these entrepreneurial activities. She also founded uh, La Pre yeah. How do you pronounce it? La Pregunta. La Pregunta. Uh, Airs <laughs> Arts Cafe in Harlem. Some alumni may know her as she was a TA for multiple classes, one of which is the one Bill and I teach, which is New Enterprises. Nor Sweet moved back to Dubai in 2005 after spending time as a biotechnology and pharmaceutical strategy consultant. Since moving back, she is one of the most prominent venture capital in the MENA, the Middle East, Northern Africa region. Currently, she is the only Arab woman in the Middle East running a VC fund as the founder of Dubai-based growth stage firm, Global Ventures. Let that sink in, okay? No. <laughs> so it so also made history as the first woman to lead an IPO in the region when uh, the interior contracting company, Deepa, was on the London Stock Exchange and NASDAQ in Dubai. In 2018, she was named one of the world's top 50 by tech, uh, in tech by Forbes and received the Arab Award for Finance. Uh, Noor has been named in the Arabian Business um, 100 Most Powerful Arab Women three times and been profiled on the covers of Forbes Middle East, Entrepreneur Middle East, and Arabian Business Magazines. In her spare time, she founded Zen, <laughs> Zen Yoga. Not <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, the, uh, the first yoga and Pilates studio uh, in the MENA, which grew to be the largest chain of wellness studios in the Middle East, which she sold in 2014. So I would like to welcome my panelists. So you're in good hands. So uh, we talked about it. This entire panel, um, and given the uh, passion at lunch, about uh, entrepreneurship. This entire panel would urge you to, um, to think about becoming an entrepreneur, okay? There are risks and there are considerations, but it can be a path. Um, I'd like you um, all to talk about how did you choose to be an entrepreneur? Um, sure, I'm happy to dive right in. Um, so I think being an entrepreneur is something where from childhood you're solving problems. 
And I think if you're raised to be always like, well, what's the biggest problem I can solve? Or how do I solve this problem? And um, so in my personal journey, I started Zen Yoga, which was the first yoga studio because I loved yoga, and there was nowhere to practice yoga. So my answer wasn't you know, anything except, well, then let's set up a yoga studio. I can't be the first one. Um, now I'm running a VC firm, not because I have a strong desire to be a venture capitalist, which is an evil term in some markets, <laughs> um, but rather because there's a massive problem in our part of the world of access to capital for founders. And so I started investing a lot as an angel investor and ultimately came to the realization that this is the biggest problem I can solve. Right? So it's, I, my perspective on being an entrepreneur, and when we meet with entrepreneurs and the ones we invest in, it's what problem are you solving? Why are you well positioned to solve it? And is it worth solving? Um, and that's all that being an entrepreneur is, and then doing it well, of course, hopefully. Um, so that's, that's my kind of how I come into it. Good. Actually, my original reason for becoming an entrepreneur, uh, and, and it evolved over time, was, was very similar in terms of wanting to solve problems. So in my prior roles, I had seen a lot of, of challenges, particularly in the emerging markets where I was working. And I felt that, as Trish mentioned, the traditional approaches just were not good enough. They weren't solving the economic development challenges that I was seeing all over the world. And I knew that there, there were better approaches and better ways. And given my existing role, I didn't have the capacity to, to make change in the, in the institution that I was in and in the role that I was in. And so what I wanted to do was find a way to actually solve the problems that I saw in, in, in a different way. And the only way that I felt that I could actually do that was by solving it myself uh, and going out and finding people to solve it with. And so that was really the driver for why I ended up going to Sloan, uh, wanting to really spend, spend a year digging in on how I might be able to use technology to, to solve these problems that I was seeing. And, and I was lucky to meet my, my co-founder there, and, and we started the company while we were students. But, one of the other main reasons that I personally became an entrepreneur was because I had started my career as a lawyer, and uh, and you have you have it's a fantastic skill set for many reasons, and it has served me incredibly well as an entrepreneur. But I was really looking for a diversification of my skill set, the opportunity to try different things, work in different ways, uh, really dive in and learn new new things, and really go through a process of self exploration. And entrepreneurship has served me incredibly well in that way. And so it's been a combination of you know, the problem solving, but also the, the, personal, the personal drive to, to grow. That's a, that's a great story. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think everybody becomes an entrepreneur because they know how to solve something that other people don't know how to solve. And that's, that's sort of at the heart of the problem. But, but then, how do you know that you can do it? How do, you, how do you decide that now's the right time to do it? A lot of other things like that all come into that conversation with yourself. And, and in my case, I had uh, a year out of Sloan. I'd worked for a teeny tiny company, actually in Scotland. It had uh, 25 people when I got there and 350. When I left, uh, three and a half years, two and a half years later. And so that gave me the confidence that now that I know a problem I want to solve, I can go do that. And so that, that experience of understanding what a high growth company looks like and getting familiar with it um, is part of it. And then I agree with you that uh, getting to explore all parts of business is kind of unique, right? I mean, it's so often that you get a job and you sit in this department and stuff comes in and stuff goes out. And that, that, that doesn't give you the chance to sort of recreate systems and make things happen on, in a new scale. And, and uh, since then, I've just loved supporting other entrepreneurs. So another story. So for me, I think it boils down to three things, love, obligation, and DNA. So in terms of DNA, I grew up in the Bronx, not very far from here, as a Dominican immigrant. And immigrants are just incredibly entrepreneurial, you know, to leave your country behind um, and to start in a new place where you don't speak the language. I was very young when I got here, but I watched my mother do that. She had a food truck and a bunch of other enterprises, and so I feel like that was in my DNA. Um, second, love and uh, second and third, love and obligation. Just being in this community and seeing so many things that weren't working, feeling like I had an obligation and a responsibility to a do something, particularly if 
it would benefit and impact someone that I love, someone. <clears throat> and so all of the work that I have done in education and now in the workforce are trying to help people that I love and people in my community and people in other communities that I might not be close to, but that face a similar challenges, like they lack opportunity, they lack networks, they lack formal education. And so I just felt like an obligation getting into MIT, getting into Columbia, what can I use with all that? How can I use that privilege in service of my community? So that's a really good segue because a lot right now, and there seems to be a lot around venture uh, and entrepreneurship success, largely around the term unicorn IPO. So Jean, how should we define entrepreneurship and venture? Well, uh, fundamentally what's happening in entrepreneurship is that you're finding a new way to do things that usually uh, displaces the old way of doing things. And so, um, and so while that's happening, uh, people's jobs are changing, other things are happening. And what we've done in the society is we've decided that that extreme rapid growth company, explosive growth company, is worthy of um, extra benefits in the, in the market. And so high risk capital comes streaming in and, um, and supports that change. And, and that's true. That's a really important part of all of the entrepreneurial uh, activities that have happened over time. But also, there's other entrepreneurship that doesn't get quite so much press. Um, you know, the, the, the immigrant uh, entrepreneur who makes a store that supports them and their family, and also lots of other people all around the world that are solving local problems there. So I just think we need to broaden the idea that it's not that, that uh, you know, 22-year-old guy in a sweatshirt <laughs> that, uh, that, that is somehow um, magical here. What's really magical here is that people all over the world are changing things and, and, um, and, and then they need to struggle to find the right capital, they need to struggle to find the, the rest of the resources that it takes to, to grow that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, ideally, we'll just start to define the whole idea more broadly to include all types of entrepreneurship. I'm going to add anything about growth and... Sure. Um, so my personal journey took me from Sloan back to Dubai um, with Booz Allen. So I'm sure many of you here have heard of Booz Allen. <laughs> um, and between my first and second projects there, I had three weeks, um, as consultants do. And on the second day, my dad, who's a serial entrepreneur, so maybe part of its DNA, um, asked me to come and help him in his office. And he was building a company. His first two companies um, you know, hadn't gone so well. And he was building a company and had hired one of the consulting firms to come in and do a reorg. The company was at about $60 million revenue, 1,000 people in six markets. And it was in the contracting space, in the interior contracting space. Um, so I sat in his office for three weeks because there was no office space and overheard every conversation. So with my typical strategy consulting hat and being 26 and having all the answers to all the problems in the world, <laughs> um, at the end of the three weeks, he asked me, what do you think of the company? And I'm like, oh, it's great. And he says, I didn't pay for you to go to college and get your MBA and give me this answer. What do you really think? I'm like, well, since you asked. <laughs> um, so what unfolded was me staying for eight years rather than three weeks. But the first thing we did was raise capital. So we raised $100 million for the company, and we went from 60 revenue to 600 in three years. Um, we went from 1,000 people to 9,500 people, and from six markets to 22. We became the largest global interior contractor in the world. Um, then I led the IPO in April 2008. We was very lucky on the timing. And we had Morgan Stanley and UBS mm -hmm. as the book runners, and we floated at a 1.2 billion valuation. So it was the first unicorn out of our part of the world to IPO, except it wasn't called a unicorn because 11 years ago they didn't exist. <laughs> so in the last 11 years, unicorns have magically appeared. But ultimately, it was the private capital that enabled us to grow and to create 8,500 jobs in emerging markets in three years. And he was solving a problem, like most entrepreneurs solve problems, and he was solving it for the hospitality and infrastructure industry. So as the Four Seasons and St. Regis's of the world grew into new markets, they wanted the quality that they were used to. Um, so it was a simple business. It was a traditional business. We IPO'd it, did really well. We were very lucky. We were very lucky on the timing, the boom. It all worked out. But again, without that capital, it wouldn't have grown. We wouldn't have created those jobs. And I think the same thing for Zen Yoga, my little yoga studios. 
you know, without the right capital, wouldn't have created all those jobs, wouldn't have had that opportunity to really create a market and educate people about yoga and inform them. Um, and so I think that private capital is actually very, very necessary in the growth of companies. I think where we've gone wrong is, you know, how much is valuation and financial engineering and how much is actually value creation, right? And allocating value to potential hype um, and oversubscription is just something that the market likes to do. And ultimately, you know, hubris runs out and we end up back where we were 10 years ago. Um, but I don't think that the allocation of private capital to enable growth is a mistake. I do think that it does need to be done more globally. And as that starts to happen now in emerging markets, we have lots of emerging market entrepreneurs that are solving real problems that exist in emerging markets that don't exist here. So our founders in you know, the, the emerging markets where the next billion consumers and next billion workforce are coming are really solving problems worth solving rather than solving that 2% problem. And as they solve more problems that gain more traction, you'll find an increasing amount of private capital flows flowing their way, which is where we are now. It's still you know, growing quickly off a small base, but we'll get there. Okay. By the way, Aileen Lee, who's an MIT grad, coined that term, unicorn. So, and she regrets <laughs> we'll thank it. Her for it later. She regrets it. <laughs> so, Scar, a question for, for you. Um, some skills may not be obvious of an entrepreneur. You know, they, but every, entrepreneurs have multiple skills. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's synonymous with the work that I'm doing. Also, I'm trying to get people in the workforce that don't have traditional pedigree and or networks. And I think what we need to believe and understand is that people learn differently. Some people can teach themselves something. Some people can learn something on the job. Some people can learn, you know, um, and, and transfer skills from other settings. And I don't think it's any different from entrepreneurship. I think, um, you know, life might be your first skill. So if, for me, for example, growing up very resource constrained uh, meant that I had to do a lot with very little. And so, you know, as I launched my, my journey into entrepreneurship, women of color raise less than 0.2% of venture capital. And, you know, I've been on the receiving end of that. I've probably raised less than my peers. And I've, you know, with like 265 convertible note, I had to get to my first million in revenue, whereas my peers probably not the same. So, you know, I think you learn from, you know, from, from life, from your peers, um, from, from other industries. Uh, but I think resourcefulness really is something that um, I don't know that you can necessarily learn in a classroom. You can definitely talk about it and find examples of how to do that. But when I think of not every skill being obvious, no one asks you straight up necessarily when you go and sit with a funder, like how resourceful are you gonna be? I think it's assumed that you're gonna be that way, but if you don't have the funding that you talked about that's so catalytic and you know and important to get you to the markets that you need to get to before you can you know start turning a profit and grow really rapidly then this resourcefulness is like you know then you have to figure out how you learn that yeah i would actually comment on the the need for uh, the team to be resourceful cuz you cuz no one person is going to do everything it's really a story about understanding the the gaps in the group and also uh, the diverse perspectives that can be brought by the group uh, to solving the different problems. And really, when, when, you're, when uh, you're an angel investor as I am or a VC, um, you know, that's one of the things you're looking for is, it, how, how is this team going to cover all the different problems that need to be there? In very early days, you, know, you may be uh, just a small number of you and um, trying to do a thousand different things. Um, but later, it's really important to get clear on who's responsible, uh, get that responsibility clear, and start uh, growing uh, a functional organization that can, that can scale. Gambit, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, I have, I have a, a, a few thoughts on, on the skills, that the unique skills of, of an entrepreneur. So first, I, I completely agree with what you're saying about the resourcefulness. I, I usually use the word resilience. So uh, looking at your own personal life experiences, you don't, we, don't, we don't tend to do that often in, our, in a professional setting when we're trying to write our resume or, or present ourselves in an interview context or, or, or for some sort of a role. We don't, we don't usually turn to our 
personal experiences. We look at our, our professional experiences and what sort of skills check what, which boxes. But I think that for me, I, I've ha I had a lot of challenges in my life at a, at a very young age, and that taught me to be incredibly resilient. And resilience is something you really need as an entrepreneur. And, uh, and I think that, that I overlooked that experience and that part of my life as something that I could actually bring to work and bring to growing and building a company uh, until I actually was doing it. And then I said, wow, you know, the, the things that have happened in my life personally have really helped me to, to grow this company uh, professionally. And then the, the second thing I would say is, I, I, we've already mentioned that, that I, I, I used to be a lawyer, and I think that uh, 10 years ago, if anyone, anyone had said to me, in 10 years, you will be running a data company, and you will be managing a team of engineers globally, I would have absolutely laughed in their face, and I would have said, there's no way that will ever be what I'm doing. And I think that, that we, we sort of tend to put ourselves into boxes of what it is that we can accomplish and what, and what, what our experience is. Again, like what, what does it mean to be a lawyer? What are the skills that I had from that? I, I can do a lot more than just read a contract. And it, takes, it took a lot of time to even show the world that. It's like the ability to, to negotiate, to, to manage clients, to, to, really, to really do all of, all of the things that you need to do on a day-to-day -day basis as, as an entrepreneur, you can draw on, on these really unique skill sets that, that might not really seem to be the, the perfect fit from the start. Yeah. Do you want to add anything? Okay. So um, we had a spirited discussion at lunch on the uh, supporting MIT and Sloan alums, but supporting entrepreneurs when you were how, how are you currently supporting the MIT entrepreneurs, and how did MIT support you through your journey? Sure. So um, I'm fortunate enough to serve on the board of the MIT Enterprise Forum, and we throw a business plan competition every year in our part of the world, um, which we saw, I think, three years ago, one of the winners, it was three years ago, called Wrap Up, used the 50K that they won um, to start their company, and they were just acquired by Voicera, which got acquired by Cisco two months ago. So that was one of like the regional, really it's tech talent, it's deep tech, it's voice recognition that comes from the region that, get, that scales off the back of the 50K that MIT EF had. So that was one of um, our kind of like star moments. Um, in terms of MIT entrepreneurs, I mean we have, MIT, we have 140 MIT alums in the UAE. It's a very close knit community. Um, we try to stay involved, we do what we can. Anytime people reach out, we're helpful. I think. MIT, for me, when I was there, framed entrepreneurship. So I think I've always thought of myself as someone who you know, sees a problem and fixes it and, and moves on. Um, I think what the classes really provided for me were an opportunity to, to put a framework around that in my head um, and to realize that there's a community around that rather than it's just a skill, but it's actually something that you can do forever. Gabby. Yeah, well, I started the company at, at Sloan, and so there was there were a lot of resources available to us as students, which uh, which were were incredibly helpful. Uh, starting with things like the the sandbox, we we got I think fifty thousand dollars in total or something like that. I don't remember exact the exact number over the course of the year, um, so that we could we could actually uh, start buying data sets. We could we could actually go out and hire people, uh, do things like that that we that we needed to do, and we we couldn't we couldn't access any 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 money. In, in any other ways, uh, to Trish's Scaling New Ventures class, uh, which, was, um, which was a class that, that we were taking as we were actually um, closing our first contract. It was happening simultaneously, so it was really, it was really great for us to, to have uh, the, the, the support of, of, of professors, and, and, uh, and, um, and Brian Halligan taught that class with Trish. I mean, it was, it was a really incredible experience to have that, that, that community around us to really, really support us, even in those very early days. And then I would say uh, Delta V was really transformational for us as a company. Uh, so, so it was, we, I, I'm, I don't know if all of you know about Delta V, but it's, it's MIT's accelerator. And, and so right after we graduated, we went, we went the following Monday, we started, we started Delta V. And it was just a perfect uh, environment for us to, to feel still safe 
uh, and to have support and not sort of, sort of get thrown out uh, into, into the world to try to figure out how to, how, to, how, to, how to get this company off the ground. And we had the support of, of Trish and everyone in the Trust Center, which really made such a difference for us uh, and, and really helped us grow as, as, as co-founders. Uh, nobody else that was with us that summer is still on our team, but it really helped us to, to grow and, and, and I, we're, we're incredibly grateful for that experience. Jean. Well, um, I think my husband blames uh, my classmate at MIT for me falling in love with angel investing. <laughs> and so a little, a couple of, uh, about a year after I had had a successful exit selling um, my, my company to 3Com, uh, my business school friend pulled on my arm and said, but you're supposed to invest in my idea. And sure enough, by the next morning, I was the first investor in Zipcar. Wow. And so, um, so it shows how long ago it was, but, <laughs> but it, was, uh, it was an exciting ride. I was, uh, I was the CEO of a venture-backed firm at the time, and so I was pretty busy, but, um, but I kept trying to get in and, and help and fix. And then the next thing you knew, it turned out that I just loved working with early stage startups. And so that's pretty much what I've done, is find a way to always be in the role of working with early stage startups, uh, most frequently as an angel investor. And um, over time, I came to realize that I was in a room with 60 guys doing their investments, and I was the only woman writing a check. Every time I brought a woman with me to the meeting, she'd go, Mm, not for me. And, and so I thought, mm, I better fix this. So pretty soon I, uh, I brought the, a branch of Golden Seeds to Boston. And for angel groups, they've gone from about 4% of the uh, active a angels in angel groups to about 25 or 30%. And sure enough, about 30% of the investments from, um, from uh, angel groups uh, now go to women-led firms. So sure enough, it, we can fix this. We can even fix it over at the USVC firms if we work hard enough at it, long enough. So I've been doing lots and lots of angel investing, training people to do that, um, uh, being a mentor. Um, and uh, of my over 200 uh, direct portfolio, over 50% are women-led firms. And then about 12 years ago, I wasn't challenged, no, no, eight years ago, I wasn't challenged enough. So I decided to add in, um, add in uh, uh, focusing on ed tech companies. So that's what I do now is really run an accelerator and a whole bunch of other ecosystem support systems to address um, change in education because everybody deserves a fair and equal education, um, both uh, early childhood, um, elementary and high school, and also colleges. And then more recently, I've been working in workforce ed tech uh, uh, because the skilling and reskilling issues in society are going to keep growing as, the, uh, as, as automation comes in and changes more and more jobs. So, um, so it's pretty fun. And, uh, and, and what MIT's done for me is infect me with this idea that this was what I wanted to do and also always be there as a part of uh, the groups of students that I were mentoring. Uh, whether I was actually filling in for a while at the Trust Center, uh, sitting around meeting with st students for about two years straight, or other aspects of the whole ecosystem. So it's just a, I, I consider the importance of building ecosystems around entrepreneurs one of the most important things that we can do. I think it opens up um, each part of the world as, as, it, as they need to um, change and grow. Okay. Uh, so for me, uh, while I was a student at Sloan, um, I took advantage of every single opportunity, <laughs> one of which was interning for uh, Jean and helping her do the first ed tech conference at MIT. Do you remember that, Jean? Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, so that um, I did, I think also being in that community allowed me to like be fast tracked to a bunch of accelerators, mass challenge, then get into um, fellowship funding circles. I got going green and new new profit that fund social entrepreneurs. Um, so I think I was very lucky and you know, definitely felt supported. Um, last year, I was asked by this group under open learning at MIT. So MIT boot camps or boot camps that happened, they basically take 24 steps of discipline entrepreneurship 
and other frameworks and take them on the road across the world and they invite MIT um, entrepreneurs to serve as coaches. So I went to Turkey and then this year I went to, um, to, to Australia right. to help coach uh, aspiring entrepreneurs and I remember walking out of those experiences and thinking and always felt like I could bring really um, uh, forward feedback to the people that I was working with and I was like you know what I felt like I got an extraordinary entrepreneurial education at MIT but I don't know that I graduated prepared to become a social entrepreneur um, and so I brought this feedback to the MIT open uh, the MIT boot camp team and they're like great well then why don't you help us write curriculum um, so that we can start um, some work around social entrepreneurship and systems change not that MIT doesn't do social entrepreneurship but it hasn't been like we have an impact lab and so you know everything's going to come under this impact umbrella and so now i find myself coaching uh, uh aspiring entrepreneurs and now for the first time writing curriculum and trying to imagine what where this curriculum can help take people and how they think about proximity and obligation and really structural hairy systems change um, that might be different um, from you know the day-to-day -day Silicon Valley framing that we're given every day on how to like build and grow businesses. Okay. Um, so I'd like to take questions if people are ready for that. Um, but one thing that you'll see here is that every, they're from different seg segments, but there's a commonality through there, and you can learn from other entrepreneurs even if that isn't in your wheelhouse. So you, you, we need to utilize the community. Any questions? Oh, all right. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. Hi, thanks for that. Um, is, there, uh, is there more for social entrepreneurship? Um, and if so, is there a formal way that uh, alumni can be involved in the social entrepreneurship and the teaching of it? Sorry, I didn't hear that clear. I think I heard, is there more on social entrepreneurship and a way to be involved? Okay, um, so at least this initiative that I am part of is new. There's a lot going on uh, at MIT, particularly around, you know, like um, healthcare and climate and inclusive innovation. So if there's like a sector focus. I'm sure many of us here can point you in specific directions. Um, but in this early part, uh, I'm talking to a bunch of entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, and asking them, what do you wish you knew before you started off on this? And then trying to distill what part of this can be, can be taught. Um, and so happy to share all those learnings and figure out you know, if and how there are any ways to, to support that. No, I don't have that, but that we should make that another session because we are starting to track that uh, because it, we have, as I was explaining earlier uh, to the group, 50% of the students that come on at campus are, are curious entrepreneurs, so they don't know what they want to do. And then there's this ready to go, 10%, and what we find is they are typically serial entrepreneurs. Once they come in, they have an idea, and then they have another idea, and then they have another idea. Um, but I will see if I can get that data. That might be quite interesting. But um, there's a, our focus at MIT is on education and educating the entrepreneur. And then after that, we don't really measure how successful the company is. Even though Ed did this, um, most of our focus is on did the entrepreneur learn while they were in uh, our courses or in our programs. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes. I'm just wondering, um, what kind of things are you seeing today from maybe some of the companies that you're working with or, or investing in, in terms of you know when a company has um, you know a great product and they've achieved product market fit and then they're trying to grow to the next stage, 
What are you seeing in terms of marketing strategies and growth strategies to break through the noise and grow? Anything innovative <laughs> or interesting? I, 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 I think I'm happy to take this, but from much more of like a global perspective. Um, so, um, you know, as a young VC firm, we have seven portfolio companies now. We like to think of our, ourselves as the ones that enable global growth. Since investment, five of the seven have gone into new markets and grown their revenues, not just costs, internationally. Um, because, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a point to clarify. Um, the strategy that we've used with the founders to really cut through that is piggybacking off your clients. So try to find clients that are not, let's say, the top 10 companies in the world because they're just impossible to get through. But if you find clients that are in more than one market, right, whether it's verticals or whether it's geographies, and then build a relationship with those customers and then piggyback off those customers. So we focus on enterprise tech. That's easier to do than consumer tech. Um, but in terms of breaking through the noise, and then it's, they all use the land and expand strategy. So for example, one of the companies in our portfolio has 16 modules for field workforce management. Right? It's a SaaS. So it's like, fine, we'll just do this one thing for you. It's tiny. It's going to cost you $15 a month for 10 of your people. But then six months later, it's massive. So it's really land and expand, piggyback off your clients, um, and really focus on a niche and solve a problem worth solving that can be quantified. It's, I cannot under stress how important it is that you quantify the problem you're solving for them, because that's where people are happy to pay. Yeah, I think in some of the rapidly changing markets, it's very, very hard uh, to get above the noise, right? I mean, right now, if you're in marketing tech or something like that, I, I think somebody counted there were um, 24,000 companies. And, and it's really hard to, for mere mortals to keep straight what the difference are, is between them all. So, so, uh, so but, I, but I would stress again that um, find a problem that's really worth solving, work on that product market fit, and, because 80% of your sales will come from 20% of your features. And so you really have to find out what it is that people are buying from you and make sure that they do them and, um, and, and make sure that market's big enough, keep growing the company. And there is no single answer. There's a, you know, every single company is different. The set of issues for every company and every industry is different. And uh, probably one other uh, piece of advice is to, is to get to people in your industry. This myth that all startups are the same is just a myth. Um, every industry that you're serving has very, very distinct uh, behaviors. And bothering to learn the industry and think about the, the sort of competitive ecosystem in that industry is absolutely critical. So there is no answer. That, that was a long no answer. <laughs> <laughs> One more. Um, hi, yeah, thank you for sharing your inspiring stories. I'm Anna from Colombia. I'm a consultant, but when I'm not doing PowerPoints, I, I, I run an NGO to promote women entrepreneurship um, down in Colombia. And uh, one of the things that we have seen there is like sometimes uh, we, I mean, the, the community support each other because they, they become suppliers and they become customers within the same network, right? So I would like to ask you, in, in behalf of, the, of those women that I'm representing today, uh, what kind of things you do in your entrepreneurs, in your companies, to grow that community, to grow that, those, those women? Uh, I, I mean, we hear about investing, and we hear about uh, mentoring, but uh, do you have any other strategies to, to grow the uh, community of women entrepreneurs? I mean, I recently adopted a strategy which, um we have our team of six people. We have three women and three guys as a VC. But I found that I was spending 95% of my time with guys. That my calendaring, my scheduling, everything was just like guy entrepreneurs, male LPs. And literally, sometimes a week would go by, and I might have one meeting with a woman. So I made it a strategy that for every five guys I see, I need to see a woman. And so, the, so my partner, who's a guy, was like, really? I'm like, really, it's come down to this. Because if I can't find them, if I can't find them, then I'm not doing my job. And so the associate on my team, who's awesome, so her perspective was, that's great. I'm like, let it be an LP. Let it just be someone I'm mentoring. Let it be someone in the community. It really doesn't matter. But in order to grow the community of females, we actually need to give them time. Time's our biggest asset. It's what we have you know, it's scarcity in. 
um, more than capital. And so if we can give our time to the women around us, then we'll enable the community to grow. I've been part of a couple of accelerators and other communities of entrepreneurs. I think only one was women uh, focused. Uh, Google for Entrepreneurs hosted um, women from like 12 different countries. And something that I do when I'm part of any of these programs is we always start a WhatsApp. And the things that happen in this WhatsApp in terms of like sharing resources, praise, opportunities. I just feel like that's what helps us increase community. So we're often recommend, so if I got funding, or I've had women, and usually only women, come to me and say, you know what, I was pursuing this funder, but I don't think I'm a fit, but I think you would be a great fit. Or I got money from this funder, and I think you should too. And, you know, and they make introductions, or you're having a baby, let's celebrate that, that's amazing. Let's make sure we give you everything you need. And I, and I find that of all of my communities, this one all women community from all around the world is the one that's like, there's always a text or two there of like how we're uplifting, connecting, sharing, doing something for each other. And I wonder if there's a way for, you know, for the community of women that you support to kind of self-organize around those cohorts. Or if they do another program, figure out how to get with those groups. Okay. Yeah, and, and I would also just add that getting together is often good. I mean, yeah. look at this room. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> That's what I, I was going to close with. This is a great opportunity. The conversation earlier as well, there's interest. We've just got to figure out how to harness that interest. And also, there are things online. If you are, want to be an entrepreneur and you're thinking about it, there are online resources from MIT that are available. I would encourage you to take a look at those. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, panel, very much. Thank you.